history of kind of indie, but what what the the deal was was in in uh, you know the depression uh, came along. They had uh, less entries than they wanted in the race because the cars had gotten so expensive. They had the you know the uh, front wheel drive Millers with the supercharged motors and all that. It's super expensive cars. So so in order to get the um, car manufacturers interested again, they came up with what they call the junk formula, which is this, and uh, it's basically allowing them to put the stock block motors, you know, Ford, Chevrolet, uh, Studebaker, and so forth, uh, in the race cars. So the, so the so Studebaker actually built five of these, and um, so this is the, Holy it's the Studebaker straight eight, and it's the same engine that's in, we have a Studebaker president up there, it's 1928, it's basically the same motor, this one actually has seven or nine main bearings rather than the other one in there is seven main bearings so but um, but other than that it's pretty much the same configuration except that this has four carburetors on it uh, that has one updraft carburetor and this makes um, well when they when they raced it um, it had uh, it was making they said 210 horsepower um, wow and uh, back in the day back wow. in the day and, yeah that was uh, a lot of horsepower in the 30s and yeah. we think we think we're making more than that. So um, uh, so um, we bought the car from a out of a museum up in Wisconsin. Um, and the history of the car, basically, is so that so there's I've got a picture in it somewhere. Yeah, by Ben. Um, I don't know where to put it here. Hold on a second. Um, but uh, anyways, can't remember. So. Uh, it actually had a, uh, it was a more normal looking car, kind of like that. It was this car right here. And um, then in 33, they, they actually went to the wind tunnel in uh, University of Michigan and came up with this body style. This is actually one of the first cars designed in a wind tunnel, wow. which, is, which is pretty interesting. And um, they also moved the engine. Uh, forward like seven inches and did some other stuff you know with handling and so forth so so they actually gained you know what is that five miles an hour in qualifying that was, speed that was big back by up. doing that and that's quite a bit five percent in speed and uh, the driver in both cases of this car is a guy named Tony Galata who's from Kansas City so kind of a local connection back and uh, and uh, he was a journeyman, a journeyman kind of driver I think he ran like in 13 Indy 500s, which in that day, just surviving that many is a pretty big deal. Yeah. He actually uh, lived uh, in the... Uh, what's that? Seventh and 33, I think. Wasn't he? Yeah, it took seventh place with this car. So, um, but uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, you know, they, they went to the two, the two person configuration as well at that time, instead of the single driver. Uh, Kind of more, I think, to emulate sort of the passenger cars and stuff like that. So, so um, yeah, we we bought this car out of a museum up in Wisconsin, and uh, the the guy that we bought it from actually equally interesting is a guy named Brooks Stevens, and he was an industrial designer that worked for uh, Studebaker, and he was he's famous for designing um, a number of things that we use every day, like the uh, see the Miller High Life logo, the uh, uh, <coughs> The Oscar Mayer mobile. Uh, he's the guy that, that coined the phrase "planned obsolescence." Uh, you, you know, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. So he had uh, he had like the Evan Rude, he worked for Evan Rude, one of one of his contracts, and basically they they changed the engine case each year to make it look more modern or whatever. Mm -hmm. kind of, so, but he, he so he was an interesting character, and, and uh, my dad got to know him uh, in his later years, and and. Uh, and he knew that my dad was interested in Studebakers and stuff. So when he passed away, the curator of the museum called us and said, "Hey, do you, do you want to buy this car?" And, and so, so we we uh, we did. We thought it was just a really interesting timepiece. And then, so we uh, uh, bought it like in 1996, and uh, then we did a, a couple of rallies with it. And we decided that we needed to go get on the track. So so since about 2000, we've been racing. It. We run it in Indy. Actually, this last year I ran it in Indy um, and ran it at the same lap speed that the qualifying laps were. So we ran about 115 mile an hour average lap in Indy with, with it. 
Now, the fact that it was bricks. Yeah, she probably corners her. She probably corners much better today. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I can't imagine doing that in bricks. I mean, I knew these guys were just so brave, but. Uh, and and back then they were reaching near 170 in a straightaway with these cars. Well, no, he was his his top straightaway speed tires. was probably, um, you know, 130 probably 100. That's all this car did. I am. Yeah. Shocking. So we were we were doing 128 at the end of the straightaway. Oh really? And the average lap speed because it you know that's you didn't have to slow down very much for those turns. The turns were much better. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's that's it. So that's uh, this thing rides like. But it's actually it's actually terrifying. Yeah. It feels like two hundred. Yeah, yeah. So, you've ridden in it. Mm -hmm. So the. It's uh, it's a it's straight axle. It's very very um, <coughs> primitive, you know. So you just break. got the two solid axles, leaf springs. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's about it for. For road racing, we've we added we added, the, uh, on, well, each side we added the these the gas shocks right here just to help keep the car from right. leaning. Yeah, and sort of eliminate so, a little bit of roll. Yeah, yeah, and that actually has made a huge difference for us. So, so. Um, is that nose? Is that metal or fiberglass? What? Need fire seat on. <laughs> I hope not. Slow down a little bit.